Hello, everybody. How are you? Uh, greetings from Made for Spain and Portugal. Here we are to speak about Andalusia, other destination in this beautiful land. Julia, can you give us a hand on the technology side, please? I am happy to. Hello, everybody. So as always, you are all muted, so we can't see or hear you. If you have any questions, please do send those to us at any point throughout the presentation. Just write on the questions box in your panel, and um, we will get to all of those at the end. And also, this is all being recorded, so you will get all of this information delivered to your inbox tomorrow. Back to you, Virginia. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for being here with us and thank you to Andalusia Tjursen for the opportunity. So we are going uh, to catch up where we left uh, last uh, Thursday, not last Thursday, the Thursday before uh, in our last uh, webinar, uh, because we are in Huelva province, which is not one of the top destinations of better known destinations, although it's a very special destination within Spain. And within Huelva, we are looking at the, at the coast. And now we are be, uh, going to be driving, navigating through the inland. Uh, so it's an area not so visited, but, uh, you know, very special. It's very, very untouched. It's very unspoiled. It's, you know, this part of Spain. Most of it, uh, you know, it's a lot of border with uh, Portugal. So I uh, think it's an area that was a border for many centuries. Um, so, uh, there'll be castles, there'll be places where to fight to the enemy, you know, with the Portuguese when they came. Uh, part of our history, we're part of the same kingdom, and the other part, we were big en enemies. Like, for example, here you see this castle in the top of the hill. You are going to see, be seeing many of these if you explore this area. And there are big castles, big churches on the top of the hill. Look at this. This, if you look at the door, you see it's Gothic. It's a Gothic church. And Gothic churches usually have beautiful, big uh, glass windows with tons of different colors, uh, really beautiful. Now here, here you see the door is a Gothic. So it was built after the Moors stay here, so by the Christians, but they were still fighting. So they didn't have the big windows because when in the village, you know, was uh, the, the opposition came, the Arabs came, everybody jumped into the church of the castle to be, you know, indoors. And look at this. This is not Sevilla Cathedral. This is uh, the cathedral of the, the church. It's a church, it's a huge church. But it's a part of the world that was very wealthy. Uh, we're speaking about the 16th century, 17th century. Very, very wealthy because they could build these churches in, uh, in, a, in a, a small city. Here you see, again, church with big thick walls defensive walls uh because the enemy was nearby and at the same time it was uh, important also in the 19th century uh beginning of the 20th century important you know making money so you see the little cities uh, flourish and um, very beautiful squares and very beautiful uh, uh, buildings uh see this is we call it El Paseo. We have, this is a square, but usually it's like a very long avenue or walk, like in Barcelona, Paseo de Gratia, or in Madrid, Paseo de la Castellana. Every city, every village in Spain, uh, they have a little Paseo. It's the, the place where, you know, they dress up in the afternoons, in the, you know, the afternoons when it was not too cold, but too hot. So to walk around, so they could see each other and maybe, you know, go and find a boyfriend or, you know, somebody interesting to chat with. So this is the Paseo, it's a very Spanish uh, use. So this has a, an open air contemporary art museum, which I think is great because it's very traditional area. The patrimony is beautiful, like very, very traditional. And then you get, you get to see these uh, fabulous uh, uh, pieces of art, very integrated in the, in the village. Uh, as you are seeing, we have a lot of, you know, all the, all the south of Spain, yeah, you see the whitewashed uh, villages, the houses. And in many occasions, this happened. Spain was really, and especially in the south, very colorful. It's a little bit like when you go to Mexico, and you see in the, in the Caribbean, in Mexico, in Cancun, Cosmel, all these uh, very colorful areas. That was the color of Castile. That was the color of Andalusia before the big 
pestes like the one we're having now. We now we have COVID, but we have you know many other uh, you know diseases that were disaster, disasters uh, for centuries. So it was a disease that they decided to turn to paint every house white, so to kill all the little animals because of the material they did the, this white with. So that is why you will see very many. Uh, uh, why the, you know, maybe the clients ask you for the white villages. Well, we have white villages all the south of Spain. It's very Andalusian. So you see the traditional white houses with all these contemporary art is very, very fun, very nice. And of course, here they have the Hamon Museum, the Ham Museum. This is where the Iberian, the good Iberian ham, uh, you know, the, the animals, the pigs, the, live in these areas so this is why we say jamón de jabugo so there's a full museum so you know travelers can learn about everything about this um, which is a lot so they were uh, searching for uh, silver they were searching for silver in the undergrounds of you know these mountains these villages and they found uh, the, this was the mid 19th century and they found this amazing uh, group of the maravillas, the marvelous things, uh, and it's just a, a waterway. The water was the sculpture that made this fabulous grot kind of caves uh, underneath the uh, Aracena. It's very, very, you know, it's very fascinating, it's very unique, and it's also very impressive and very important because of the length. It's very long. It was one of the first groots in Spain, we have many now that can be visited. There was one of the first that could be visited. It was at the beginning of the uh, 20th century. This is Aroche. This is an interior part of Spain. Uh, the sea is far away. Uh, to go here, to visit here, in this part of the world, you have to drive there. And you have to go there. Otherwise, you don't pass by there. And you feel this because it's still very rustic and very authentic and very, very unique. It's very special. Here uh, you see the size of the temple. You see the wall on the right, big temple, impressive, but really gone to the floor uh, because this part was very wealthy in the 16th century, 17th century, but not uh, longer. And this is why, uh, you know, many of the monuments uh, went to the floor and they build up again, you know. So they took advantage of part of this wall. Uh, they could recover, but then they, they have to build like a little house on top. And if you see here, you see this window that is made out of brick. And if you look a little farther, you see the shape of a Moorish window. Uh, why? Again, just to remind you uh, how this uh, Hispanic art, authentic Hispanic art that is called Mudejar, we say, maybe not in English like Mudejar um, or similar, uh, is uh, was how uh, these Arabs artisans, these workers, is, it was the way they built. So when they were following instructions from the head of the builders, they built this uh, with the stones, this amazing Gothic gate. But then when they were said, do a window on top, they did the Moorish window because this is what they they knew how to build. And of course, you, using brick, not stone, using brick. So this is the, 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 when you say Gothic, you say French architectural style. When you say Renaissance, you say Italian. But when you say Mudejar, that's Spanish, 100%. And can be only seen in Spain and in South America, you know, built by, you know, this when it was part of Spanish colonies. But look at these interiors. I mean, for years, they were very, very, and really wealthy. Because you see this and you can feel it when you look at the, you know, the churches, it's, you know, the older beliefs. And it's a part of the world that they love the fiestas also. So you see the streets, it gets hot, hot, it just gets cold. Uh, again, this bell tower, Mudejar style, all over. And, you know, the city walls have to be open to enlarge down the hill, the villages and the cities, you know, when people began, you know, uh, the population began to grow. But again, never losing their essence, the very white villages, even though this is Habugo. So again, the brick, stone, and the castles on the top of the hill. 
So this is why many of these uh, villages, you go up the hill, down the hill, it's not like easy and flat. It's really amazing. It's very, very beautiful. So there are many villages to be visited, a lot of the, uh, the churches, the beautiful uh, castles, the beautiful Mudejar style, and villages and the day-to-day -day life of these people. And you know, most many of these churches that you see or we see were uh, mosques before, and they turned into churches when the, the land, the village was uh, conquered by the, by the Christians. The up the hill, the on the hill is very authentic, very, very special. You know, it's, it's amazing how when you say Andalusia, you can be very well speaking about Marbella, uh, which is one world, or the Granada or Seville, which is a very different world. And then you go in line to places like uh, Jabugo, Aracena, Roche, and it's fascinating, you know, it's very much. In many ways, it reminds me when I, I'm 58 years old, and when I was a, a girl, 15, 20 years, uh, this is how Spain looked like. Then we entered the European Union and got lots of funds to recover our patrimony. So we're still recovering part of it. And, and this is a very flavor, authentic, old style. So you see, again, the brick, again, the huge buildings that uh, were used as uh, you know places to be safe and uh, to stay away from the enemy actually and look at this interior again we need to invest a little money to recover it but it's very very authentic it's very much you know how it was very untouched very untouched that's the word and flowers everywhere happy land, authentic villages, and great views, because the landscape here is fabulous, and it's, it's like very green, and then with the dots that are the beautiful villages. It's, it's very, very special and very, very nice. And you see again the stones together with the brick, very Spanish, very Mudejar. And inside all the gold, Linares de la Sierra, more brick and stone all over, with the arches, the whitewashed villages. You know, the down life, easy going. You really escape from the masses, but you know what? You are like 85 kilometers away from Seville, less than an hour drive. So, kind of. Cool, right? I believe your clients will love this as much as we do. It's very, very authentic experience here. And it's on not only the beauty of the villages, the architecture, and the amazing landscape, but it's also an area to, to enjoy and discover the active and with great food. Uh, La Rosa, very old villages, all the same pattern top of the hill castle or big church, whitewashed houses going down the hill, beautiful stones, uh, streets, and tons of flowers all over, and the white, the brick, and the stone. Bull ring, of course, this is a uh, mosque that was turned into a church. Again, you're seeing the, the window looking very much Moorish. The brick, stones, all over. I hope you are enjoying it because it's very, very unique. And not many travelers get to visit uh, here. And it's a fabulous place for hiking. Uh, they are be they are beautiful paths. I strongly recommend spring and fall uh, because the colors and the, the the colors of the leaves and the weather is not that uh, it's not that bad. nice. Great biking routes and as we were speaking, beautiful landscape. And here in this beautiful part is where these little animals live. These great pigs. They are I'm saying great, but 
when you think of a typical pig, it's big and it's white. So these are small and they are black. That's why when you speak about Spanish jamón de jaburo or Iberian eh, eh, ham, uh, we are speaking about these uh, black little pigs that are very different uh, animals uh, to the to those big pigs, uh, you know, to prosciutto pigs. So prosciutto is different. So some differences about these, these pigs. Um, these are small, they are black. They live free in the countryside. They mostly ate acorn. So to be an Iberian pig, you have to be at least 50% of this breed, small and black. And then the other 50% could be a normal pig. Uh, so what will make the difference is the breed of the pig, but also the, what they eat. If they eat the acorn, it's the best quality. If they combine this with local you know, food. So it's depending on all that. So it's very, very different. And what makes it very special and very different is that when you eat the fat of these pigs, so the, 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 the pork meat, the, the Iberian pork meat, uh, it's not bad for you. It's like the olive oil. It's good grease. It's not bad grease. This is why you may be seeing in this part of the world many people eating all this grease and not being that fat or cooking with it. Because remember, uh, we cook a lot of pork historically to prove we are not Jewish. Uh, so that is very much in, in what we, we eat. Uh, but it's good grease. It's good for you. They are nice little animals, and this is what they eat. Acorn. So this is me visiting one of the uh, factories. So we take clients there to visit, and this there's a gentleman there explaining the process. They put the the, the meat of the, the pork meat in, in salt, and they have it there drying up and kind of cooking themselves in salt. And you know we go around and visit. Look at all these labels. You know the cords are green. Here the cords are white. Different color cords because it means different things. So here's our friend uh, explaining. So if it is the black one, it's because it's 100% Iberian pork uh, eating that uh, acorn. But if you get the green one, it's only 50% the breed Iberian pork, and then they've been eating acorn and been eating anything they find in the field. Okay, so it's, it makes the difference. So it's how they differentiate one to the others by the court. So we take travelers here to taste it, to learn the difference, to learn the different parts. And as you see, it's very rustic, very casual. You know, it's big room. Uh, we usually have two, four people, so plenty of space even after COVID. And how to differentiate a good ham and a bad ham is uh, very easy. If you see all the grease, or one of the factors, all the grease on the sides, it means they have fitted the, the animal like, very fast. So it gets bigger. So that's why the grease is on the side. If you see the whites inside the meat of the of the pork, it means the animal has been eating very healthy for many, many, you know, for all his life. Here you see all these little white inside. It, you know, it means it's good pork. It's very good for you and it's great. And I wanted to show this because it's the wine we taste and it's wine produced in this province in Well Laos. So it's what we offer in our, uh, uh, well, we take clients here to visit. Of course, we produce olives in this area also, the fabulous olive oil, all around, great mushrooms. And we cook with them. Yeah, we're in the season. I keep on mentioning because in the truffles, the mushroom in Spain are fabulous. So chestnuts also, cook with them. Polea is one of the favorite desserts. So from here you can go to Seville. Uh, very, very easy. I said it's like an hour drive. So here you have some restaurants, of course, offering the local delicatessen, of course, with ham. A lot of uh, pork here. This is from Tinto to Odiel. These two rivers, very important to, to uh, Huelva. So sardines, of course, with fish all over. Remember, we are surrounded by water. Uh, the eggs, remember, we don't have eggs for breakfast. We have them for dinner, for lunch. So, of course, eggs, uh, huevos con jamón, eggs with ham is one of the top, top favorites in every house. 
Uh, and we have very good chefs in this area also, so to enjoy here the mushrooms. Producing crafts, ceramics, leather, very nice. This hotel I love is very basic, but it also is very beautiful. So it's this other luxury. It's not the marble bathroom, but it's very, very nice. You know, every corner is beautiful. They've been over like open like for 25 years. There's a British couple that, that owe it. So it's not luxurious, but this, I mean, amazing. There are other, nothing really five stars top top luxury, but you know, there are some nice and uh, beautiful places, like for example, this Posada is very, very touching. It's very special. So, as always, we do custom travel. So, very happy and very ready to take care of whatever you need whenever they let us have travelers return into our beautiful part of the world. So thank you very much, Julia. I don't know if we have questions. We do have a few questions. If anyone has any last minute questions, feel free to send those our way. Um, first up, what's the best airport to get to this area, Virginia? I would say Seville. I would say Seville. But remember that you are not far from Lisbon. I mean, Seville is like one hour drive, but from Lisbon will be, you know, less, less than four hours. So, you know, it can be very well combined with Portugal or jumping into it as you go from Spain to Portugal. You don't need to be landing in, in Andalusia if you have a different itinerary. Okay, great. Speaking of, there is a question about Portugal and combining Spain with Portugal via this area. How would you recommend that? That'd be great. That that will be a great fun trip, uh, because you know you'll be crossing all the. You you could begin in this one. I would say you drive the Alentejo, you go through all this. You know, it's it's Portuguese, but it's again very Spanish because it's very similar, very similar to the landscape we've seen, and um, and again also producing the Iberian ham. So you can do Seville, go through the Alentejo. You can end up in Seville, but you can also go through Alentejo, Lisbon, Alentejo to Cordoba. It's very, you know, you cross all these mountains, very beautiful, and they then drive to Madrid. Or to Seville, uh, I mean, from south to north, uh, you can do Marbella, Seville, stay in this area, visit this area, and from here, cross the, the, the Alentejo, ending up in Lisbon. Very, very nice. Again, very off the beaten path, so truly magical. Okay, and if clients pick up a rental car in Portugal, can they drop it in Spain? They may, uh, but will cost a lot of money. <laughs> uh, so this can be done, but it's like five, six hundred more euros more. They they do this if you pick up in one country and drop in another country. So in many occasions, what we can do is drop off the car in Portugal or in Spain in the last city, have a driver taking them to the next destination when they can pick up a rental car the following day. So we, we know how to, you know, uh, make that work. But it's totally true, totally true. It can be done, but it's expensive. It's, I don't know. It's, it's very weird because this is Europe, so it shouldn't be that difficult, right? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, can we go back to the map again so that people can understand exactly where this area is in relation to Spain and Portugal? Okay, here we go. So, Seville, let me... Okay, sorry about that. I thought it was going to my... So, here's Seville. Here's this one. So, this is what I was saying, going to Ever and then crossing. Uh, you know, this area, Montserrat, is amazing. There's this beautiful uh, uh, hotel, Sao Lorenzo de Bagojal here, fantastic uh, farmhouse. And then you cross the border, this is the biggest artificial lake in Europe, cross the border, and this is our part here, in the Sierra de Huelva. Huelva is the province, you see the province here, Huelva, the capital city, so this is the Sierra, and this Sierra is where these uh, beautiful little ports that we love to live. So that will be the map. And then here you have Cordoba and Seville. And there's this road up here, can be done. And Madrid, part of the way up, and Marbella here. 
Okay, great. And can you repeat the name of the first town you talked about in the presentation? Someone missed the first few minutes. Aracena. Aracena. And um, the, this... The castle top and the group of the uh, Maravillas. Okay. And for the person that missed it, the recording will be sent tomorrow so you can see the details all in that recording. Um, all right. And how many days would you recommend in this area, Virginia? I got this I got this question a couple of times before and you know it really very much depends but it's a it's a part of the world that if you arrive you can even spend there five six nights because you can the day you arrive one day you explore the next day you do the hiking the biking the following day you go to Seville the following day you go to learn about the Iberian uh, um, and all of a sudden it's almost a week after so depending on how much uh, your travels are into the 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 active and the and exploring this is more it's more it's a lot of cultural really but more like to explore on your own you could have a guide one day to really see where things are going are about and but then it's a lot about you know explore on your own or somebody to take you hiking or by uh, but it's the exploration. I do, I do recommend renting a car here to explore. Like, like, the, like the days were here to really, you know, let's go to that village, let's go up that hill. Have you seen this castle? It's a, it's a lot of fun when you travel. Okay, great. Um, and so would this be appropriate for someone that's having their first trip to Spain? Well, it could be very appropriate, but uh, again, uh, we, all of us, we do customizing, custom travel. So it will depend on the traveler. If it is a traveler that is the first time they come to Spain, they are 85 years old and don't walk very well and don't like so much being outdoors, I would say no, of course not. But if it is for a young couple that wants to, is the first trip, maybe want to visit Barcelona, Madrid, and then explore a little of the south, uh, and they really want to, to get the magic of the, the off the beaten path, the authentic, uh, you know, unexplored, I would include this, no wonder. So it's very, very magical. Yes, why not? And then from here, go to Seville, which is the capital of Andalusia, of course. Fabulous. I love that answer. Why not? Um, so even though the, the accommodations are not five stars, would you really recommend staying in this area instead of in Sevilla? Well, for some people, depending on the person again, depending on the person, it will depend if they want to be in the city or in the countryside. If they want to be in the city, don't send them here because they won't be happy. And for example, Finca del Buen Vino, the service is fabulous and it's very, very beautiful. So although it will be more similar to a four star, there are other things that make it very magical. So maybe for a younger people, I, I would say it works very, very well. There are other areas of the beaten path, uh, like, uh, you know, Antequera, that we spoke about, that they have nice five-star hotel. So, you know, we'll very much depend on the traveler, because we need to match the best that Spain offers to that specific client. That's the magic we do. I mean, that is what the business is about. So, you know, our company, <laughs> we do that. So really depending on the traveler. Sorry, I cannot say yes or no. I would love to. <laughs> um, how about the Posada del Castaño? What is unique about that property? Because it's very authentic and it's very rural. Um, but it's very basic. It's very basic. There you need to know, really know, it's very, very basic. It will be more like a two, three star. But it's very beautiful and will give the travelers an authentic experience of the rural uh, Spain, rural Andalusia. And some occasions, some travelers believe that a trip, and I agree, you cannot be always in the big five star marble bathroom. It's a lot of fun to sometimes include like one, two nights in a very, you know, very different type of accommodation. You know, it's like when you're reading a book, it has to have up and downs, and everything has a beauty side. <laughs> Very true. Um, now, do these little villages have market days, kind of like they do in the south of France? All of Spain, all of Portugal. We have markets everywhere. Uh, they're usually food markets. 
uh, in, in every village. And then in the big neighbor, in the big area, there's one village that once a month or once a week has a market with objects, more like we were speaking about the south of France. Yeah, but that is all over Portugal and Spain, yes. Okay, and our last question for today, is this area a, a year-round destination or should it be avoided during winter? It rains. It rains. But I, I personally don't believe that's a reason why avoiding a place uh, because it rains. But it's a, winter is more rainy and summer will be more dry and, you know, high temperatures during, you know, midday. Uh, like everywhere, I guess, in Portugal, Spain, summer, sp spring and fall are, were great. But I wouldn't, I mean, I don't see a reason why avoiding the place in winter. It doesn't get, get that cold. Not really. Okay. All right. Well, that's it for the questions. Again, this will all be delivered to everyone's inbox tomorrow. And our next session will be on Thursday, December 3rd at the same time, 6 p.m. Madrid time. And we will be visiting the Serrania de Ronda. Um, Virginia, I will leave it with you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I'm looking forward to next uh, session. Uh, thank you for everything. See you very soon. Thank you.